everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Anna and I'm with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. Today we have Katie Snap joining us who is a quality engineer at the National Labs and holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Katie owns her own consulting company and is trained in the psychology and neuroscience of leadership. Katie specializes in business development, marketing, strategic planning, product customization and delivery, and customer service, and will be presenting negotiation skills for women-owned small businesses. We will be using the Q&A function to take questions and welcome attendee participation, so don't hesitate to ask us any questions you may have. We'll answer questions throughout the webinar, so don't be shy. This, the next slide, Katie, if you wouldn't mind progressing, thanks so much, is features some COVID-19 business resource links, which I won't go over in detail as we'll send you a copy of the presentation at the end of the webinar. Please visit our website at nmsbdc.org to view our upcoming no-cost webinars or to sign up for our no-cost counseling services. I'll also send a follow-up email to you with this information. With that being said, thanks so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Katie. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, Anna, and thanks for, for hosting and helping out with all of the behind the scenes stuff. Anna and I just realized that our Zoom feature has a beauty filter on it automatically. So we were you know, pretty excited with how we were coming across on the video. And then we just found out that it's because there's a filter on it. <laughs> but hey, that's one of the, you know, you, you got to use the tools you can, right? <clears throat> Today, we'll be talking about some other tools. So we're going to get some um, a, a training around um, objectives of getting e your negotiation to a point where you would like to be better. Whatever that is from where you are right now, we will get to to where you're better. If you've been terrific in the past, but you feel like you need it tightened up just a little bit, or if you feel like um, you need to start from square one, this is perfect for you. Here's the objectives. Um, and let me say something about these. I like to use the approach in training of, um, or development, let's call it, of really looking at something from the fundamental point. So rather than seeing that as um, basic, because it is basic too, but it's the fundamental of uh, an approach to, to a negotiation that you can then build on. So that's the difference between a basic and a fundamental. A fundamental is a baseline. You will find that if you've been great at negotiation in the past and you, you use some skills and techniques that have you know, fine-tuned you and you need to come back to those, those will fit into the uh, template that we'll be looking at today for how to go forward in negotiation. So here's what those objectives are. We'll look at the three stages of negotiating and um, these, these help you stay a little bit more organized. We'll look at the key skills that work in each of those stages so, so that you can intentionally work through a successful pro progression of it. We're gonna talk about how to utilize power and influence to help leverage your effectiveness. Always a good idea also always a good idea help with your mental preparation there's a lot of head work that goes on with this so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that so you can be aware and composed and uh, we'll wrap it up with how to walk in and walk away with confidence so that your voice is treated with respect people hear you and uh, you're considered during the interaction okay got a little bit of work going on in the background here at my office so if you see things going on in the background um, I'm hoping we don't get distracted with a lot of background noise, but I don't think he's going to be making a lot of sounds. So it's a busy place around here. Here's the outline. Uh, we're going to start off with the nine mistakes that women make in negotiating. Not to be focusing on the negative, but I do feel like when you see something that you know you're not doing ideally, it's great to recognize it. It's great to recognize it. So I'll, I'll give you the nine that tend to be typical there. Um, I'm gonna present a template that's three stages in negotiation. Shoot, super easy, super easy, but that's what makes it helpful as a fundamental. We'll talk about key skills in each of those areas. You'll find that um, one of the things I really like to do in approaching personal development is to give you specific tactical and practical things. Um, and one of those is scripting. So, you know, you're not gonna go into a 
negotiation and look at the script and say, thank you for showing yourself here today. And, you know, something real stilted. But I do believe that when you're in certain scenarios where you need to move something forward or you're stuck or you hear someone throwing a, um, uh, a barrier in front of you, it's great to have practiced something that gets you started verbally. So I'm going to give you a few examples there. We'll be helping with your mental preparation with a little trick that I use, <clears throat> and that'll help you with your confidence as well. Okay, so that's the outline for today. Let me start uh, just a bit with a few statistics. As you hear some of these things, please jump in. Anna, I think you want folks to participate in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, the Q&A box. Yes, ideally Q&A is the way to go and the chat is for technical issues. Okay, got it. So please, and do not hesitate to do that. And in fact, if uh, you need to jump in and offer some sort of a challenge or a question or a, something to share with everyone else, um, uh, please let us know and, and we can call on you as well. Okay, some statistics, some hard facts. Follow me with these and see if any of these are manifesting in your particular situations as well. 55% of women and 39% of men walk into a bar. No, this isn't a setup. <laughs> no, but on this statistic, much more women admit to being scared to negotiate, all right? Still a certain number of men, but there's that aspect of fear, right? All right, I'm gonna ask you all about where you are on that in just a minute as well. Um, also, although you probably don't decide on your own salary for many of you that are on the call here, right? As if we get one. Here's a statistic that's indicative of how we fail to put ourselves out there when it does come to money for ourselves. Most people don't negotiate their salary. 70% of women and 54% of men do not negotiate salary after receiving a job offer. Perfect example, granted she was young, but my oldest daughter, first year out of college, probably five or six years ago, had a job offer with a part-time job that she was um, carrying while she was during the school year, and they asked her on full-time. Um, so she was going to, actually, they wanted her to start full-time as soon as she could, even if it was before she was going to graduate. They still wanted her to get a degree. But um, she immediately, you know, went from an hourly job into a salaried one. She was going to be working someplace else. She was going to be showing up as an employee, benefits, all those things. So I asked her, you, what did they offer you? I don't know. <laughs> this is my daughter. I don't know. You, so you got a job offer. That's terrific. But you don't know what it is. Nope. I don't know. I'm, I kind of don't care, mom. You know, she kind of did the mom. Don't make it sound like I'm you know, asking for something. Isn't that interesting? Because that's really kind of how we talk ourselves out of things is, I don't know, do I deserve it? I don't want to look, you know, greedy. I don't want to look like I don't um, belong asking. That's not appropriate. Um, I even asked her what sort of benefits she might be getting. I don't know. So that's really indicative of what happens is we just don't put ourselves out there. I like this picture. I think this looks like, you know, ladies out of the 80s with their suits on, because I think I used to have that suit. Um, women just like men only cheaper. And this is really what we do is we compromise ourselves by not putting ourselves out there. Um, one more statistic. Most businesses expect new suppliers to negotiate and almost never start with their best offer. In fact, people who don't negotiate are almost always accepting less than someone was prepared to play to pay. Simply choosing to negotiate, even if you're poor at it, is going to yield results. So keep that in mind. Simply choosing to negotiate or jump in and ask a question or jumping in and just getting clarification on something is going to get you a little bit farther than accepting right off the bat. So one study showed that employees who chose to negotiate increased their starting salaries by an average of $5,000, right? Failing to negotiate your salary at the beginning of your career over the long haul can cost you, I mean, this, this makes sense if you think about it, one to one and a half million dollars. So that's a lot of money. That really makes you feel like doing a little bit now is gonna save you in the long run. All right, so let's take a look at, um, I'm gonna ask you all two questions. So I want you to participate in this poll if you will, please. 
the first one is I'm going to go ahead and launch it before I read it. Which negotiation situation are you all currently facing? So I'm very curious as to where we are all in the room with what challenges we have. All right. So you'll see that there is uh, five different scenarios. Go ahead and answer as many as apply. Thanks, everyone. Like to see your numbers coming in. A couple more of you still to go. Okay, another 10 seconds or so. Okay. All right, so let's see where we are in the room about where we. Um, have situations. Um, I'm going to drop down to the last one because it's the highest scoring. Most of you are in situations where you negotiate with clients or suppliers. Okay. All right. And those are usually hard contracts, right? Uh, negotiating is not just the contract stuff. It's also the informal type stuff as well. I need to negotiate a business contract, almost half of you. I often negotiate with prospects about work. Okay, about a third of you, a few fewer, I negotiate on behalf of someone else, but a handful of you do. I negotiate informally with other business people. So that informal stuff is important, isn't it? Because that tells us day-to-day, uh, -to -day, transactionally, things are going on. I mean, if I'm just talking about, hey, you know, how long I'm going to get for lunch or whether you know, someone wants to agree with me on something, I mean, there's a negotiation aspect of all of those things, right? Oops, I didn't share them with you, did I? There, all right. So that's um, that's a lot of negotiating. That's a lot of negotiating. All right, I'm gonna ask you another question. Second follow-on question here. <laughs> this is where we were, where we get confused over how to do this. See if it works this time. Last time around, uh, I had set it up incorrectly in the back on the back end. We, so let's see. I think we slayed that dragon. <laughs> Here we go. See? Do you see it? Yes, I All do. All right. Second poll question. Uh, multiple choice again. This is how you see negotiation. It's okay to admit fear. <laughs> Somehow it kind of helps you slay it when you can admit it. It's definitely me. I let fear get the best of me mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Another minute. Or another couple seconds. Okay. All right, I'm gonna end it, share the results. Here we go. Most of you, I need to learn the basics of negotiating. Okay, you're in a great spot for that. Um, I'm scared of negotiating, only about half of you. Hey, those of you that are fearless, I love that. Um, and that's gonna get you through to stuff. So that's gonna keep your head clear because when fear is involved, it bypasses the prefrontal cortex and keeps you from thinking straight. I want to learn to negotiate contracts. All right. We're not going to talk about contracts specifically here, uh, but we will be talking about how to get at the table to get things started. I just need reinforcement with ideas and support. We'll definitely do that. And then uh, Teresa says, I wouldn't say scared. I would say lacking confidence. Okay. All right. I like that. Lacking confidence. Okay. So now that we kind of have a feel that we're, we're many of us on the same page, let's start with the mistakes that we make, all right? Some of these, maybe more than a few, might fit you. 
Um, but let's see where we go with these because this first one can certainly affect what happens with fear. If you're mis misinterpreting negotiating for arguing, think about what effect that will have on you seeing it as something productive, right? So principled negotiation as defined by getting to yes and getting past no, both really very popular books. Principled negotiation is about getting both sides to what they need in, uh, in their principles versus arguing can be about this, percussion, concussion, discussion. And when we're arguing, we're more likely to see it as something that's a win-lose. So that right there can be a mistake. Failure to set the table, in other words, knowing ahead of time that you have prepared everyone in order to come to the same scenario, right? If you have the same expectations, you're more likely to have a collaborative uh, conversation. Uh, the mistake of talking too much. Um, Susan Scott says uses the term, uh, let, let silence do the heavy lif lifting. Let silence do the heavy lifting. Accommodating too quickly for those of us that see that, you know, typical in ourselves of wanting to be someone that's supportive, wanting to be someone that is getting everyone what they need, then we accommodate to it quickly. There's also a term in getting past go, getting past no called a BATNA. BATNA stands for your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And that's going in with a backup plan. If you go in wanting this, but you know you're willing to give this, 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 or the very last one, that's what the best alternative is. So knowing that in your preparation is important. Continuing here, letting emotions derail, derail your logic. Just a comment about um, the emotional aspect of being face-to-face -face with someone and feeling like something can be tense in what you're talking about. It, because if you see it as a win-lose or if someone is turning it into a win-lose and it looks like it's, you know, you're going at some sort of a conversation with, you know, going a bad direction or the other person's getting upset. When emotion is involved, we know this about brains. When emotion is evolved, our minds become reactive and use a responsive part of our brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is um, the part of the brain that is, um, helps us survive. It's the survival technique. So it's used to responding very quickly and reactively without thinking. It bypasses the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, the executive part of our brain, higher thinking, logic, smarts, makes sense, right? We want to be thinking with that side of our brain. We cannot be thinking with both our reactive brain and, the, and, and our prefrontal cortex at the same time. So if you think about it, if someone you know, throws you a curve, uh, if someone says something to you and it gets you off in, uh, in a second to where suddenly you're reactive or you see red or you feel your face flush, same thing that's happening if somebody throws a baseball at you. What's your first instinct? You stick your hand out and you cover it. You're, you're, that's your responsive um, way of survival. So we do the same thing with our emotions in situations where we're face to face. Negotiation, this can definitely happen. If the other person is playing games as well, they will try to get it to happen to you. So now we've just bypassed our prefrontal cortex and we've gone to our reactive brain. You cannot get back to thinking in a straightforward way in the way that you came into the room planning until you get back to your prefrontal cortex, right? The only things that are gonna come out are things that you might have to actually apologize for later. So letting emotions derail your logic. I wanted to give you a little side note just on that because that is very important. When you know that that's happening to you physiologically, being aware of it can sometimes help you get back to, um, to what we call um, back to center, all right? Forgetting that everything is negotiable. Everything is negotiable. Um, I'm gonna add something on this as well. Um, and I think we might bring it up just a little bit later, but when you know that there's a possibility in the conversation for negotiation, you'll find that your courage to bring something up as a possibility 
is, um, is more likely to happen. And when I have taught this class at, um, at UNM, we had uh, several series of classes where we had some time in between. And so I gave the students a field assignment. This is a great field assignment. Field assignment between like the second and the third class was to go find something that you wanted to get from someone else and ask for it without just, just without, let's say without pain. So at, ask for something, here's a better way of putting it, ask for something that you're expecting a no answer. All right, so I'm driving through McDonald's and I get my, you know, chicken, chicken McMuffin and uh, I guess it's an egg McMuffin, okay. And um, I've already got, you know, a glass of water, but I'm thinking I might like to have a cup of coffee too. I didn't order it though. So I just asked for it. Can I have a cup of coffee? So I have done this before and you would be surprised how many people will accommodate you. Everything is negotiable. But also there's a lot more yeses that you'll be getting than, than you think you ever would be. We tend to think it's gonna be no's, no's, no's. Failing to, failing to prepare, in addition to setting the table, failing to prepare yourself is critical. And then the ninth mistake that women make in negotiation is failing to ask. And if you don't ask, you know you're not gonna get it, okay? Uh, the two books that I mentioned are Getting to Yes and Getting Past No. And, uh, and I'm just blanking on the, um, I'll come up with the, the author here in just a little bit. And there might be somebody in the, in the room that has the answer. Very uh, super standard books. And I'll tell you about the, in, in just a little while, when we talk about principle negotiation, I'll tell you about the concept in both of those books that made them so powerful. All right, so let's go to the structure. So here's the template that we're gonna use for the process of conducting a negotiation. This is rocket science. Preparation, interaction, follow-up. Super easy. Preparation, interaction, follow-up. You can remember that, right? We'll go into each of them. So let's talk first about preparation. And I've got five different tips in each one of these. In preparation, your objective is to do your pre-thinking. I don't care if you're doing this while you're driving your car. I don't care if you sit down and you type it all out, write it all out or type it all out. But to be able to have this thought through mentally is a great way of getting you started. All right. So the first one, number one, is describe the issue. Think about what it is that you are negotiating. And that sounds like it's, well, yeah, of course, but you would be surprised how often you might go in thinking, um, let's say I'm, I'm hiring a graphic designer to do all of my marketing for the next year. Um, I might be going in thinking that I, I want to line her up for, you know, four publications over the course of 12 months, and she's thinking something completely different. So to be able to know exactly what you need is important. And then part of the negotiation is, is scoping what that is when you get in the, in the same room together. So describe the issue. What is it that you are trying to figure out? Is it a problem? So for me, let's say that it's uh, my problem happens to be you know, I, I need a uh, graphic designer because I have been having trouble getting outreach to my um, pack of followers, you know, my 5,000 people on my email list in a way that's effective. If I can describe that as an issue, even better. <clears throat> All right. So what is it that you're, what is the scope of what you think you're going to be talking about? And then is there something that is, you would call an actual issue or a problem? Number two, describe your intentions. What do you want to be walking away with? And what do you want the interaction with the other party to be? So is that intention of interacting to get a negotiated contract? Or is it just to find out what the person's capabilities are? Okay, so those two questions, the, the issues and the intentions will be very specific to the scenario that you're in. Maybe it's formal, maybe it's informal, and it will kind of adjust based on that. Also in preparation, here's the number three step. I want you to predict the other party. So what do you think you're gonna see? What, what are you gonna see about um, what drives them? What do you think their hot buttons might be? But I also want you to consider the consideration for location, um, physical things like your position at a table. Will you be able to read body language? Um, what about your clothing? 
you know, what are you going to do? If it's important, you'll probably be thinking about what you're going to appear as, you know, professional, casual, regular every day over a cup of coffee. Do you want to set ground rules? These are all really good things to think about. And in fact, for this, I would probably do a quick brainstorm just on a blank piece of paper. Where do we think we're going to be? What, uh, what am I going to start off with? What do I think his hot buttons are? Do I have a sense of what his style is? Is he a tough negotiator? Is he likely to play win-lose? All right. That's important. And then I'm going to have you go into something just a little bit more specific to the topic. And that is his or her interests, positions, and options. So let me define the differences between those. Positions are the what of a negotiation. Interests are the why. So you're going to want to spend a good bit of time distinguishing between positions and interests. And I'll, I'll give you a I'll give you a classic example. This is um, this is a bit of an older one, but it was um, an early one that that I learned when I was learning principled negotiation about uh, 20, 25 years ago, whenever the Montano Bridge went in. So the Montano Bridge was intended to connect the west side to more of the part of the uh, east side of, of New Mexico, of, of Albuquerque, that a lot of the residents had a terrible time trying to get to. There was only two other bridges otherwise in town. So the interests, um, well, let me start with, with the position. So the positions tended to be, you want the bridge or you don't want the bridge, all right? And think of how hard that is to negotiate. I want the bridge, I don't want the bridge, right? How quickly is that set up for win-lose? All right, so in principled negotiation, you look at what's below the surface. So picture this being an iceberg and the position is really just what's at the top. The interests are what's below the surface that you need to dig for. So I want the bridge. What are the interests of the person that wants a bridge? So ask yourself, why do they want the bridge? I need to get to the other side more quickly. I need to save time. I spend more time with my family if I'm less time in the car. Uh, it's less dangerous because now there's more three freeways across the, the, uh, the river. You know, you can, you can go into a lot of what those interests are. What would you think the interest might be of the person that doesn't want the Montano Bridge? Now, I happen to have heard a lot of it at the time because I lived in the North Valley and knew exactly, you know, the people that were putting ribbons around old cottonwood trees and save the tree and everything else. So interests on this other side, on the opposing side of the bridge, were to maintain the rural feel of the North Valley, to not have all the traffic coming through, to uh, keep it quieter. Um, as you can imagine, there's you know, some real predictable type, type interests. So now, if we're looking at the how and the why, of accomplishing getting somebody over to the other side of the bridge while maintaining the rural feel of the North Valley, are there solutions to the way that we build this bridge? And in fact, fast forward to the solution, they, uh, a, a, a flyway over most of the North Valley, actually it kind of goes through it and a little bit, uh, a little bit buried so that the sound is muffled. Um, and there is no connection to the North Valley until 4th Street. So everything between the river and 4th Street is indeed still isolated from the traffic. Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely. Was it perfect? No, but it was a great way of looking at what the principles, um, the principle negotiating is by identifying what the interests are. So that, dear friends, is going to be a great part of your preparation is thinking about what someone else's interest might be if indeed it's a negotiation on a he said, he said, she said, or this side or that side, okay? You can also ask some questions of yourself. Why am I taking this position? Why are they taking that position? What interests are, what interests are reflected in that position? What interests are reflected in this position? What interests are they, um, what interests might they not be getting met by those position. So maybe there's a solution here that we haven't thought of that 
gets some of those interests accomplished. If you see where you're going with some of this, it becomes somewhat creative. All right, so you're gonna look for uh, um, underlying things like what's important to someone a long time, um, resources like people, sales, making money, spending money, high prices, excessive demand, things like that. You really wanna kind of shuffle through where the other person's coming from. And I would say you just get in the other person's head and consider what that conversation might look like ahead of time for the negotiation. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. All right, you can see that that's a big part of the process is the preparation. It's like painting a room. Masking it off is like 80% of the work and then the painting's really fast, okay? The last of the preparation, number five, for those of you that were in this category, wrangling with your fears. Um, what is there about the interaction that you feel is poking at you? And if you can name it, that would be terrific. If you can name the fear, why am I, why am I scared? Uh, am I afraid of something that's gonna happen? Uh, am I afraid of not looking eloquent? Am I afraid of not knowing what I want? Um, and then if that's the case, what are ways around that? Okay. Even when you're insecure about what you're negotiating, you can be secure about it being insecure. And that might look like statements that were, I call these pocket statements because you can quickly put them out, pull them out of your hip pocket. Statements like, well, I'm not really sure where this is going to go, but I feel like uh, one thing that I might want is, all right? So there was an insecurity behind that, but I just stated it in a way that was confident, right? There's a super, super great trick in masking your insecurities. All right, I'll share a story with you all about a woman that I had done some um, work with. And I wanted to share this. This is kind of classic being during Women's History Month because it's very, I think it's very much of a women's issue. Um, it's one of the reasons I like having female audiences is that we have different baggage. This is a perfect example of this. So I was working with a small organization uh, and nonprofit, and they were, they had me in to come help do some work with their board. Um, and they, they work closely with the court system in the state, but they have chapters in a lot of different communities across New Mexico. So they're aligned very closely with the legal and the government communities. So the executive director of this one chapter in one of the remote um, uh, areas, I'm, I'm going to call her Sandra, but her name is not, real name isn't Sandra. She was the executive director of one of those. And uh, this particular chapter was very highly regarded in the region, but they also had the burden like any other nonprofit of securing and maintaining funding for the organization. So of course they held fundraising events, friend raising, right? To improve their outreach and maintain their image. And at one of these events, I think it was a cocktail party. And I had talked to her, I think I saw her on her board maybe the following week after that, or really shortly after that. Sandra was telling me that at that friend raising cocktail party, she was talking to a local businessman, we'll call him Bill. And uh, Bill had been on the board in the past, so he knew the organization. He'd also been involved in local politics and he was up for reelection at the city council in this small little town. And as they were discussing the upcoming um, efforts for, for con you know, continuing the fundraising, she knew that she wanted Bill to continue his financial support. He'd been on the board. She thought it would be appropriate to have him continue. After all, he was at the cocktail party. So she decided to be forward in asking him. So here you are asking something, right? This is a transaction and this is a negotiation. You're at, at, trying to get a yes out of someone and through the process of positioning it, preparing for it, position, positioning it, and then give and take, you're hoping to get that out of this person. So she had said something like this, Bill, we're close to our annual fundraising goal. You've been a great supporter in the past. Can I count on you to donate tonight? Bill said, I'd be glad to, as long as you're willing to support me for city council. All right, so remember Bill was up for a reelection at city council. And Sandra said that she clammed up and it really caught her by surprise, but she wasn't really sure why her reaction was that way. 
And we talked about it just a little bit. So here's a negotiation that you're putting out. Someone is coming back and saying, yes, as long as. It felt like it was a bit out of left field. You know, now is this, okay, I'm gonna, maybe you weren't ready to do the quid pro quo. Maybe you were. Um, and if you were, that's great because now you're ready to identify whether that's something that you're willing to give for the other. Is it ethical in your mind? Is it appropriate? Um, that's up to you and that's what you might have to think about ahead of time. What was interesting about what Sandra said at the time was she said, you know, there was something about it that made me feel like I was putting out. Here he was asking me for his vote and it just, you know, if it had been a guy, I don't, if it hadn't been a guy, I don't know whether I still would have felt the same way, but it, something about it just didn't feel right. And so I started looking back at all the baggage that we deal with with women. And this is part of what I think happens in negotiation is we have the sense of what are we giving of ourselves and is it appropriate and is it right? Um, and so in many ways, you know, men get in there and they roll up their sleeves and they're just like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna smoke a cigar together. I know that's stereotypical, but there really is some sense of, you know, I wonder whether they don't have a lot of that personal space that they feel is violated when they have to do that negotiation. All right, so I want you to think about that. That's kind of a complicated issue. And um, I do think in some cases it might be what we're having to deal with is what's going on in our head with what we're giving, okay? What do you do if the person you're trying to negotiate with tells you that you're arguing with them or they are hostile? All right, let me ask, answer the first piece. Um, if they would say, if they said to me, you're trying to argue with me, I, I would bring it down a notch. I would actually, I'd step back and I would apologize by identifying, wow, recognize, first of all, recognize, wow, shoot, I didn't realize that my voice was raised. I really do have a way of talking loud. Um, I'd probably throw in a smile and do something really very genuine that, that, that helped them feel like I was not arguing. People have different definitions of arguing, but I would definitely address it uh, to, as to what my actual intent was. Now, if I was trying to argue, <laughs> just fess up to it, right? Um, or what if they are hostile? If someone else is hostile, I don't think it's the right time for them to be negotiating something. But you'll have to use conflict management techniques in order to bring them down. Remember when I uh, talked about using the prefrontal cortex versus using your amygdala of the brain. If you're, when we've been in this way before where, where we are um, heated, we're spun up, we're off kilter. When we are in that sort of a scenario, we're not using logic. We're not using straightforward language for getting something done. And it's never a good time to try to agree to something at that point. So your objective when someone is hostile is to get them down. So if they're up here, emotionally wrought in some way, they need to get down to neutral. And then you can start to have the conversation. So that skill is a conflict management skill. And that's not for the, the purpose of tonight, although I can tell you that most conflict management skills begin with listen and empathize, right? listen and empathize. And if you do that, you will eventually get that person to come down, All right? Empathy would be reflecting, wow, you sound, you sound like you're worked up, Jim, or wow, it seems like I might have um, gone into a territory that was uncomfortable for you. You'll have to say it in a way that's diplomatic that gets the other person down and that's reflecting. Uh, Jennifer says, I have a hard time asking and negotiating for things when I feel I'm not entitled to or when I'm negotiating with someone with far more experience than I am. All right, I'm gonna address that second piece because I do think that in some cases, if you are the underdog in experience and it's clear you're at a table and the other person has more experience, I actually admit the obvious. I actually come right out and, and I might start start part of my dialogue with, you know, wow, I, I am in awe of being across the table from you because I know that you have a great experience in what you're doing. I'm not quite there, so you'll have to be patient with me to catch up with you on this, but let me start with what I do know. So do something that gets you out there and have them help you through it. If they're a principled negotiator, they are more likely to work with you versus turning it into win-lose. 
Um, and then as far as asking for things that you feel you're not entitled to, I, I, you know, I would just step back and question it. What if it was that person over there that you've been working with a lot and they're as experienced as you or maybe even less? What if they asked for it? Would you think that was okay for them? I think we're hard on ourselves and there's things that we can get. Maybe it's not an entitlement thing. Maybe it's just a, I think I'm, I'm ready to try this next thing out. All right, so be careful how you frame things that are at your disadvantage. Um, and I, I, I know exactly where you're going with the entitlement thing because there's nothing worse than someone that is, you know, narcissist or this way. It, everything is about, I'm entitled, I'm entitled. Come at it from a different angle than that. All right, good questions, game. Okay, um, here's my little post-it. I've got it over on my wall and I took a picture of it, uh, but I've kept this up for years. For many of us, the spontaneous diversions from an expected direction can catch us by surprise. So I you know, often think, well, why? Negotiation conversations go one of two ways at any one moment. Either the other person states that, they, that we predicted that they may or they don't go the way that we predicted. And for those times that it doesn't go the direction we predicted, we can lose focus and uh, we can lose composure and we might stray from the interaction. So the poster that you see in the slide is what I use for my reminder. And because I have it up on my wall, it's like, oh yeah, 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 quick reminder. But you could have something like this in a post-it on your dashboard or in your planner or on the back of your phone, whatever it might be. Um, in these three steps, I find what gets me back to it. So it begins with awareness, right? Oh, how simple, yet so difficult sometimes <laughs> to be aware of what is happening. This is over half of the solution. If you can get as far as recognizing, uh-oh, I'm off kilter, uh-oh, I'm off center, uh-oh, the other person seems to be angry, uh-oh, they seem to be going at something that feels manipulative to me. You're kind of labeling it, right? But you're aware of it first. So just getting to be aware of it is really important, okay? Then you're going to look at the insight piece get a little geeky here, analyze what's going on. And we're great at this. Um, are, they, are they using key words to manipulate me? Did they bring in some history of a previous contract because they know that they want it and they think that's gonna get them one up? You know, what is it that's happening that you can diagnose without emotion? Just if you were, if you were watching it from a screen, and you were the director and you were completely emotionally separate from it, what would you say is happening, right? So awareness, insight, and then that last piece is courage. I find that all I have to do is say that word in my head. Having the backbone to do what you've just analyzed or if you can see in the analysis, something that's a way to make it forward. Um, and maybe inaction is what you wanna do. That's okay too, that's an action. The, the decision to take no action is a decision. And sometimes that can be the courage. So um, with some insight, I think you can find that you are um, tapping that courage. Um, and even if, you're, if you don't deal with fear, the courage is at least giving you insight to go forward on, on something. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, all right. Awareness, insight, courage, love that. And uh, we're still in the preparation and this is key. So in preparation, and then we'll go on to the actual interaction. Here's the last thing that I want you to remember. I use this all the time, this is fantastic. And it's a quick hip, you know, pull out of your back, back pocket, your hip pocket. To start off a conversation with a PPP, a purpose process and payoff, gets you going very nicely. Um, so let's say I'm sitting, at, let's say it's, it's that woman that I am wanting to hire for my graphic artist. And uh, I've got an hour set aside with her and we're actually gonna sit down in a room or a virtual room. And I don't know where to start. When you have a minute to take the floor, uh, maybe you've already done your small talk, you can very succinctly identify what your purpose is, 
the process you're going to take to get to that purpose, and then what you'll be all be walking away with as the payoff for that. So it might sound like, hey, um, Joanne, thanks for meeting me for an hour today to uh, take a look at what you have capability wise as a graphic artist. What I'd like to do is share with you my needs and the problems that I'm having, like my shortfalls, and then see where you might fit in so that by the end of the hour, we have a good feel for where we might be able to work together, right? Now, she has a good scope of what we're gonna talk about and how we're gonna get there. You have a good scope, you both know what's in it for you, and it works great. This is a great little tool, came from Wilson Learning ages ago, and I, I use it all the time. If you ever end up in a meeting, where someone showed up without an agenda, this works too. Just have to take over the meeting. Okay. All right. So that is the preparation stage. So that's phase one. As you can tell, that's a lot of the work. That's a lot of the work. So let's go into the interaction. The interaction is going to be four different steps. Entry, explore, give and take, and closure. So here we're going into entry. This is where you might open up with your PPP. Maybe you've thought about it ahead of time. Um, think about where you want to be mentally, emotionally, where you want to have your head, where you want to have your strength. Be present. I think I have to also think of the word, in addition to courage, I think of the word being present because that makes me just pay attention a little bit more. Um, give the room your full attention. Show empathy when it's going to be appropriate. Be ready to be yourself, down to earth conversation. Do what your mother said, which is just be you. Say what you want, say what you mean, use appropriate body language, make eye contact, display an open posture, you know, versus, versus this, this. This just looks closed, you know. Actually physically being open sends the message to the other person that you're more likely to be open to ideas as well. Um, any physical distractions or interruptions, like the guys behind me working on the roof, <laughs> that's hard. Show respect through tone of voice. Don't be condescending or sarcastic. And that's, that is the actual natural me. So try to take that out of a conversation. Offer appropriate feedback when, you know, when it's appropriate and when it feels like it's um, a good time for it. And then remember that Susan Scott, Scott statement of um, crucial, con comes from her book, Crucial Conversations. Let silence do the heavy lifting. Let silence do the heavy lifting. When you're stuck or when you feel like you're getting at an impasse, go into your head for just a little bit, right? Then the other per person will offer something up to fill the space. All right, in the Q&A, this is all great, but since COVID, many negotiations are over email. How do you get to a really good point with all the back and forth? Really great question. So if you're having, you're actually doing negotiations on email versus a Zoom or something still virtual, but real time, I would recommend real time anytime you can. <clears throat> I do think we've gotten pretty darn good at seeing people on a screen and feeling like we're with them. It's not quite the same. Um, but the back and forth is definitely going to be a challenge. And um, truthfully, I haven't seen many negotiations that start off with uh, an email one way and then an email back, then an email one way and then an email back. I do, I do know that I've developed dialogues before with someone on the other end where I've been like interviewing and trying to get information from them. And um, I like using email because it documents everything and it gives them a chance to consider, right? So one area that I would say you might be able to show a little bit more courage or ask more for what you would like is in email, if you are doing a back and forth, you can actually um, think about how you would phrase asking for something. You know, you can test it out and try it and run it by a friend. Uh, that's easier than doing it in the room on the fly. And then send it to that person and frame it in such a way you were, where you might be saying, you know, I understand that um, this might be asking for a lot, but here's where I'm coming from. So now you're giving them a chance to consider it. 
which is important because if you did that on the fly, it might catch them off guard and they might feel like you were asking too much. That's one thing that comes to your mind. Um, also in the interaction, here's something I pulled from, um, that's something called the Zen of listening. I'll let you read that for a second. I just like that, just a good reminder. Then in the interaction, you're gonna to start to explore. Here's some examples. Remember I told you I was gonna give you a little bit of sampling. What's your current situation? What do you hope to achieve? These are great questions for exploring. What obstacles have you faced in the past? What's important to you? What are the consequences of us failing to reach an agreement? Then there's a little bit of give and take. This includes showing empathy, right? Uh, I understand why you might feel this way, or I understand you need to push for efficiency, and I, I, I share your overall goal, or I can see what you're asking is for is legitimate, and I would like to meet your needs. So that's kind of the give and take of feeling like I'm working with you, I'm working with you. Here are some statements that are great for proposals. So what I heard you say is for this to work for you, it's going to have the following attributes, blank, blank, and blank. Is that right? That's a great way of checking what's there. I can agree to this, if you can agree to that. I understand your val you value the rapport we have with our members, is that right? Would you be willing to sponsor our luncheon if we use your logo on all of our mailings? That was something I used with a, a credit union. And then also remember to look for any hidden messages, nonverbal clues. Women are great at this when we see someone that's just kind of fidgety or you know, looking away, we can sense that we're very good at sensing those undercurrents. Here are some things to remember um, when you do respond. Okay, this is in your packet. If you download the um, the PowerPoint PDF, just as a nice reminder, this is a great list to review right before you go into the session as well. And then of course you have closure. So the closure can have some great wrapping up things, right? Which is important. Here's some offer statements. <clears throat> I feel like we're extremely close on this. What would you consider as a fair compromise? Or I feel like we're extremely close on this. Do you think there's room for us to meet in the middle? Um, or I feel like we have an agreement in principle. Let's work on the details, okay? So that's the interaction session. You can see where that's where a lot of the groundwork goes. That's where the, actually where the rubber meets the road goes, but so much of that groundwork is in the preparation of the first. So those first two are terrific. Then I wanna offer for the wrap up, this follow-up, because often, you know, it's so easy to go, just disappear into the, the distance without letting somebody know, hey, I'm still here. I wasn't just here for the, the deal. I'm here for the whole thing. How do you speak up? This is a question in the box. How do you speak up or redirect the conversation when you feel like someone's talking over you and there are two people and you are just the one, okay? So you're kind of outnumbered and they're talking over you. My favorite tip works very well is to go ahead and when you can jump in, ask to ask them questions or ask if you can say a few things, but it sounds like this, let's say, you know, Jane and Mike are talking and talking over me and I'm like, I, uh huh, yeah, okay. Well, the other thing, um, mm -hmm, yes. Let me ask you something. Um, I have some thoughts on this. Do you mind if I take just a few minutes to give you my rundown of where I think this would work? Now, I asked for permission to have the floor essentially, and then I wait. Okay, you're all right with it? All right, here's what I'm thinking. The, this language can help them visual clues. You know, you don't wanna do this. And you don't wanna say, can I just talk for a second? You wanna say it in a genuine way, but to actually stop the conversation and then jump in. And listen to how productive that is. It's okay, I like that you said that. Can I have a minute? I think I have something to add that might get us a little bit farther. Can I take just a couple of minutes? Okay, here's what I'm thinking. Now they're more likely, they've gotten the clue and you know, 
you can only cue people so many times before they don't shut up again. Um, but that's a great technique. And I found that that works really well. Okay, hopefully that helps. So in this follow-up, you're gonna reinforce and support. You want them to feel that, you know, maybe you send them a little thank you, maybe, you, you know, maybe, uh, you know, send them a, an instant message that was like, hey, that was work, but I think it was worth it. Awesome. Whatever it feels like, you're coming back around and just kind of wrapping it up with a bow. Because obviously you want to live to negotiate another day. You don't want to be uh, an experience that was painful. And then what are you going to do? You're going to go back to fearing it again. Um, but reinforce it. Ask yourself what you did great that you want to be doing again next time. Okay. So follow up is just that quick. And those are the three stages over again, preparation, interaction, and follow-up. I know we talked a little bit during the hour about questions that came up. Are there other questions right now that I can answer? Hi, Sam. Sam says, I have a meeting on Monday where I will be doing some negotiation. I think you would do it better than me. <laughs> Okay, let me negotiate doing that negotiation for you. <laughs> and of course, it's easy because, right, there's no stress right here. So I know you can do it. And Sam, I want to recognize you and SCORE for helping bring this to SBDC as well. Um, Samantha is, um, is, is, let's say, one of the mechanisms in making sure that uh, the Small Business Development Center gets uh, a lot of these trainings to you out in the audience. So thank you. She's been so great to work with. Thank you so much, Sam. Okay, other questions? All right, good. I know that was a lot and uh, I'm just gonna remind you preparing, preparing and get that head where you need and then you're gonna feel good about where you wanna go with that path, preparation, interaction and follow up. Okay, Anna. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything on my end. Um, so with that being said, I really appreciate you and your time as always. And thank you everyone for your attendance and um, for your participation. It was a great round of questions there, really enjoyed that. Um, and don't forget that the New Mexico Small Business Development Center is here for you to help you during any stage of your business. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. I did chat through some of our information and we'll follow up with an email as well um, that will include a link of the on-demand version of this um, webinar and also the presentation slides. So if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. And Katie, thank you again. And um, yeah, everyone have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.